Kia ora my name is Zoe Hawkins and I'm facilitating this webinar today on behalf of the Top of the South and the Top of the North Marine Biosecurity Partnerships. Uh, today we have a panel of highly experienced marine biosecurity specialists from councils across New Zealand and they're here to share their experiences and knowledge. So we'll talk about the marine biosecurity system and its components, including pathway management, surveillance, response, education, and working towards an interregional approach. Um, and we'll look at what has been successful and acknowledge some of the challenges and restraints. Um, so first of all, I'd like to do an introduction of the panelists. Um, Alice, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, uh, kia ora koutou. My name is Alice Smith and I am the Marine Biosecurity Specialist in Whangarei. Uh, so I work for the Northern Regional Council. Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, um, Dimitri. Uh, kia ora koutou. My name is Dimitri Kalila. Um at uh, Auckland Council as a Senior Marine Biosecurity Advisor. Um, and we um, basically uh, do all the marine biosecurity stuff here. There's uh, two of us at the moment, uh, myself and Scott, who should join us pretty soon. He's part of the panel. Um, and yeah, thanks Zoe. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Hamish. Oh, kia ora tato. Um, Hamish Lass, I'm the marine biosecurity team leader for the Bay of Plenty Regional Council, based in Tauranga. Uh, Peter. Kia ora Peter Lawless. I'm the uh, Marine Biosecurity Coordinator for the Top of the South, uh, supporting councils like Jono's with uh, frontline actions. And Jono. Good morning, everyone. Jono Underwood, uh, Marine Bios, uh, sorry, not Marine Biosecurity, Biosecurity Manager um, at Marlborough District Council. So today um, is a discussion between, between the panelists. We um, have an agenda of topics that, that we'll sort of, sort of work through. Um, it's a small group and I'm really happy for anyone who has a question to um, raise their hand and ask it um, or to pop a comment in the, in the chat box. Um, I'm driving the technology and, and also facilitating it. So if I do miss you, please um, just, just speak up. Um, you know, we've, we've, there's, there's 15 of us in here, so we can have a really, a really good conversation, I think. Um, and we really thank you for coming. Um, it's great to see your faces if you feel like you can turn your camera on. Um, and um, I just think it's, it's always nice to, to see, see who you're talking with. Oh, here's Scott now from Auckland. He's just logged in. Um, and um, really happy to stay on and have a discussion about anything that's on your mind um, after the formal um, agenda is complete. Um, so, um, yeah, and the, like, like I said, everyone's welcome to contribute, but we do have a, have a range of, of panellists. Um, uh, Scott, can I just ask you to introduce yourself now that you've, you've logged in? Scott, Scott's um, from Auckland Council. There. I think his phone and his microphone and camera are still off. So okay, unmute. Be, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. <there you> are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Good morning. I'm uh, Scott Godwin. I'm with Auckland Council. I'm uh, the other senior biosecurity advisor for marine for the marine space, along with Dimitri Kualala. Um, pardon my uh, tardiness. A little problem out here in the country with some power. So. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> that weather going through. Um, yeah, so I really wanted to start just with a with a with 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 a, with a question for um, those who are panelists. Um, what what can you just sum up what what we're working to protect and why? Uh, might start with you, Alice. Sure. Um, that's a pretty big question. Um, I guess what we're trying to, or in my opinion, what we're trying to protect is to look after. Um, the natural marine environment, our Taonga species, um, for you know future generations to still be able to go out and enjoy the beautiful coastlines and um, the places that they like to go and collect kai or um, you know just I don't know be present and enjoy them. And um, so I think that's kind of the yeah kind of answers both of them. What we're trying to protect and why we're doing it is because you know. Um, Particularly up here in Northland, you know, the moana is really important both to Māori and non-Māori, like it's, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time out on the water and in the water, so it's a bit of a lifeline up here, so, yeah. 
John, do you have anything to add to that from a South Island perspective with your um, aquaculture industry down there and other aspects? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hit the nail on the head. So, yeah, it's certainly twofold for us in the top of the South and specifically in Marlborough with our, um, you know, very large aquaculture industry in the inner sounds. Um, and, yeah, so that's that's a massive industry that could be affected by um, marine invasive species. But also the Marlborough Sounds uh, environment uh, naturally is under a lot of stress. There's other stresses going on in the, in the Marlborough Sounds. Uh, so, you know, why we do what we do for invasive species is to try and avoid yet another major stress to that um, the natural marine environment. So, yeah, certainly a strong twofold aspect for us. Anyone else like to contribute to that question? <laughs> I think we summed it up really nicely, but. Yeah, just um, one of the things that's really impressed me, you know, looking at these different organisms that we could end up with is that we actually have to have a very broad scope. When you look at something like Chinese mitten crab and its capacity to destroy stock banks and those sorts of things, you know, it's just like a, another whole scene. And at the moment, we're trying to get our heads around Calubra and what will that do to fisheries, for instance, looking at what's happened in other countries. So every time we have a new species, the frame widens in terms of the things that we should be concerned about. Yeah. So I guess that, that sort of brings us on to our next topic a little bit, which is talking about pathways. Um, and um, as, as councils, you, your approach tends to focus on pathways, although there's also a focus on specific, um, specific um, organisms. Can, can we just talk about, talk about the pathways and why, why, you, why you take that approach? Alice, I'll pick on you again. <laughs> Sure. Um, I guess for we we used to have a bit of a single species kind of approach to biosecurity, um, but when we implemented our marine biosecurity program here at NRC um, back in would have been 2016, they decided to have a pathways approach because it provides a bit more of a holistic view. Um, instead of looking for just one species, you can look for multiple species when you're inspecting a hull. So it's kind of a lot more efficient um, and you can, you know, it's just a, yeah, way more holistic and you can look for lots of different organisms. And we have, um, so that's why we've gone for the pathways management plan, but we also have, um, the specific species that we're looking out for in our regional pest uh, management plan. So I think we have about eight different species as well. So, cause as you can see in some of the pictures, not all of them will just appear on the bottom or um, attached to parts of a vessel. They can be on structures. Um, they can also be on the shore and things like that. So we have the kind of, yeah, multiple pronged approach to try get the best overview of um, managing these species to prevent them from having you know, harmful or negative impacts on our environment. So it all kind of adds uh, different elements into our toolbox for um, surveillance. Right. Thank you. Um, and I think um, I might ask Scott about this one because Scott has a, has a really international approach and has, has been in New Zealand working in this area for the last year or so, but the ves vessel movements around the world and how, how, how the different ways that vessel, that pests can travel um, on, on vessels um, and what you're, what you're looking out for through your work. Yeah, and this is a, a good point to make from the pathway standpoint is uh, what I've learned over the years. I mean, I started out in the mid nineties working on you know, the first ballast water study in the United States. And um, that was the big focus because of, you know, introductions into the Great Lakes, uh, zebra mussels and such. And um, when I started working, went to Hawaii, I started focusing on biofouling because I thought, oh, this is cool. This is actually bringing a lot of stuff in. Let's see what this does. And, and that's the whole thing is to, for us to focus on pathways, but not to get you as institutions, we tend to get like um, blinded by um, focusing on what, what our mission statement tells us. And even though we're, that's what we're supposed to be doing, working on biofouling and vessel traffic, there's a lot of other ways stuff can get around, even though it's a lesser percentage. So the one thing that I've learned from the pathways is, you know, you can look at these heat maps and 
you can see <laughs> all the traffic that goes to Hawaii up in the north part of the map and all the traffic that goes to New Zealand. And that gives you some idea, but there's there's other pathways hidden in those vectors that are going along there. And I think Calerpa is a perfect example because um, I brought up at um, one of the meetings that we need to start, uh, the central government needs to start like cracking down on the aquarium trade in this country. Because if you look on aquarium, some aquarium sites, they're selling Calerpa here, um, not particularly Bracopus or whatever, but um, it's a that's how the stuff gets moved around all over the world is through aquarium trade. Uh, not by ships ballast water, not by hull fouling. It gets moved by people either bringing it in their aquariums or dumping it out of their aquariums, or it just gets shipped in a little sealed bag from Southeast Asia to people who want to have a really cool plant in their aquarium. So it's just the idea of, you know, we got to keep our eye, our our minds more broad about um, the pathways that we're thinking about. That human human pathways are beyond vessels. There's other things that can come in, air cargo aquaculture shipments, fresh seafood, stuff like that. And so that's just the one of the things I've learned over the years. Yeah. And I think I think that gets really important when we're, when we're communicating with boaties as well, because something that I really sort of pick up through social media and comments is they kind of feel like they're blamed, but they didn't bring these pests in here. And um, and, and now there's this big burden on them. And we sort of we did address that through through a previous a previous webinar. But um, the language that we use when we talk to them is really important. Um, someone's got a hand up. Sorry, I can't quite tell. Oh, Jono, hi. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. I've been polite. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> interesting talking about the di distinction between pest and pathway, and, and I like that comment around sometimes institutions can get blinders on because um, in certain conversations, you take a pathways approach and say internally or the technical expertise, we're thinking right pathways, but you also got to think about it, like you said, from the boaties or from the from the common punter's point of view, sometimes with education and sometimes that broader holistic pathways, this really falls a bit flat in terms of messaging. Um, you know, humans like gravitating to something. So in certain in certain instances, you can use a, a pinup, a poster child pest or what have you, whether it be fan worm or something. So outward looking, it looks like you're taking a pest, sort of, you know, wrapping it around a pest, but um, internally you are taking that holistic approach. So I think sometimes um, you, you know, definitely don't jump in one camp or the other. You, you know, it is a dynamic space that you can be um, using certain uh, or certain languages at certain times to give certain impressions. Um, but in reality, you're constantly taking that as broad of an approach as possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I like that notion of, yeah, not being too, too blinkered or too wrapping yourself up under one certain term. Yeah. Anyone got anything to add to that? <laughs> right. Um, so I think um, we, the, as a as a country, we have a we have a a, a very um, quite an advanced marine biosecurity system that starts well before um, well before a vessel arrives in New Zealand when we're thinking about the vessel pathways. Um, and, and part of the reason that the system works is because of the vigilance and the early detection. And I'm just wondering if, if Peter, perhaps you could talk about the um, top of the South experience when it comes to keeping fanworm at bay so far. And, and, and I guess where you started from and where you've, the point that you're at now and where you think that's headed. Um, yeah, I'll get Jono to add to this because he's been a major part of how this has unfolded. But I think the really distinctive thing um, was awareness before it happened and then action um, very quickly after the first fan worm were detected. And, and then it's the persistence of the councils in conducting uh, repeated removals using divers um, that surprised myself and Barry Forrest that works with me that it actually succeeded. Uh, Barry's always a little negative on things, but, um, you know, he said it's doomed. But uh, in the end, that persistence is paying off to the point that we're getting um, zero or very low rates of detection in the hubs where it's happened and clearances from some areas. And so then the whole uh, question moves to sustaining your regional border. Um, and that actually is very difficult for us because we have uh, a large area with a lot of border and not many people out there. 
Um, so actually knowing what's moving around. And that's why in recent times we've moved to try to use things like AIS to increase our, um, our intelligence on what's moving about, what's coming into the region. Uh, and um, that's helped us with the interceptions. But the interception rate for fanworms remained pretty much the same. Um, and we, it, it, what it does really bring home to me is how dependent we are on what happens elsewhere. Any vessel leaving that's clean and free of fanworm is not going to be a problem for us. Anyone leaving that, that, that is carrying fanworm is going to create an issue for us. And we are still working on working out what our interception rates are. We'll probably be discussing that in a couple of weeks at our committee meeting. But even those sorts of things are quite hard to get a handle on. What is a, a, a satisfactory level of surveillance? What's a satisfactory level of compliance? These are things that um, are under constant review. So yeah, this is uh, fanworms been our success story, and that's after a series of, of less successful things with Andarius, Diala, uh, Didendum, uh, all got away. Um, and that's partly the organism, but most of all, it's just the persistence in actually doing something about it. So you might want to add to that story, Jono, in terms of the detail in particular. Yeah, no, thanks, Peter. I think your persistence is a, is a bit of a key word there because um, I think all too often you can have a bit of a, a hot hot flurry of response and then it kind of tapers off a wee bit. But um, we certainly... Uh, once we got started in uh, early 2014 for us with our very first vessel, um, it's only been on an upward traje trajectory since then um, in terms of um, input, effort, um, surveillance. And I have to also put a massive um, you know, massive acknowledgement out to, um, we have fortunately quite a, a robust marina management um, system in Marlborough under Marlborough Marinas that basically solely run our three key um, recreational hubs and marina facilities and uh, the majority you know, a lot of our interception and our surveillance is is in tandem so it's not just us as a council but it is done in tandem with them because they have a huge interaction they're our massive interaction point um, for all that vessel traffic so uh, so in combination with that and also um, physical in-water surveillance by um, our top of the south contractor through Peter and Barry or our own dive surveillance work has meant that um, I think Liam did a summary recently in my team. Um, you know, every vessel that we have intercepted um, in the ensuing years, coming up 10 years, there's been nothing that has come into our region more than say six to six to eight months prior. So, you know, when you when you are getting them early, you're detecting them and you're getting and de detecting mm -hmm. them not long after arrival um, through whatever means necessary. Uh, I think that's been a big, big factor in, in how we've managed to prevent it from um, touch every piece of wood you can um, prevent it from getting established so far. Uh, so Hamish has his hand up and I'm actually really hoping that Hamish will, um, I was going to ask him to anyway, talk about um, what that sort of early detection looks like in the Bay of Plenty in terms of, in terms of checking boats that come in from known hotspots and picking up juvenile fanworm or whatever. Um, Hamish, over to you. Yeah, I uh, I quite like the the persistent word that Peter and John are use. That's um that, that's something that we are pretty persistent in the Bay of Plenty. Uh, we had fanworm turn up in in 2012, and uh, given you know other locations around New Zealand, we thought we were going to lose the battle, but um we have been battling away for almost 10 years now, and yeah, we have controlled pretty much everything that's turned up. Um, we're quite lucky. Uh, we're able to throw a lot at it. Uh, we have our own we have our own internal dive team which services other regions as well, which is also uh, a massive benefit for us because we can go to the Waikato and to to Gisborne and to Napier and do their surveillance for them as well. So our borders are sort of covered and we also do a bit of work in Auckland too. Um, but the relationship stuff with marinas is, and, and haul out facilities and the ports is also really, really important too, which we've, we've noticed over the last decade. Um, we've got really, really good relationships with not only the marinas with our own, within our own uh, region, but also with those other, within those other regions as well. 
which is which has actually been really really good because the awareness you know what we're trying to achieve is is spread wider than our own our own region um so we're noticing now for both uh style clava and, and mediterranean fanworm is that we're not really finding it at all and a lot of the vessels that are coming into our region are sort of aware of, of, of what we've got going on so that's a benefit too so they're making sure that they're not you know transferring anything around that they shouldn't be um so it, yeah i mean it's it's a long long journey um dealing with marine pests that are notoriously tricky to manage to find um, and in most circumstances um they're called a pest for a reason so they're really hard to control um but we're heading heading down the right track the bell curve is sort of heading down um on our benth and within our benthic environments we're not really finding anything at all which is which is quite interesting uh, when you look at some of the the size of some of the infestations we've found, and um, you know you're talking six or seven hundred in one spot, um, which was a, a known area where, in the past, people have sort of cleaned off their vessels um, or equipment, and we're not fine. We haven't found anything there again for another couple of years. So that whole biology around the life cycle for fanworm is an interesting one. Um, if you get to it and and remove it uh, quickly, uh, you may you know stop that spread of of of, of new um, juveniles to different areas. Um, that's been quite interesting for us. It's quite new. We've sort of only just stopped seeing the recruits turn up um, in the last sort of year and a half. Um, but that is quite an interesting one. Yeah. Hey, Mish, can you just tell us what that looks like? Because I know that I know that you're really active in identifying the vessels that have come in. You check them. You, if you find something, you know, a juvenile fanworm, you recheck. So, can you just tell us a little bit about what that looks like? If, if a boat arrives, what what are the steps that you go through? Well, we we we're, it's pretty intensive the surveillance that we do. Um, so, I mean, we're checking both. We've only got two marinas in Tauranga, um, so we're checking them four times a year. And uh, we also get notifications of any new vessels that come into both of those marinas and our swing moorings as well. We have we don't have as many swing moorings as Auckland. We've only got three hundred odd, so that's uh, about probably ten percent of what Auckland have got. Um, and then if something is found, uh, we normally go through the process. The, normally the people are reasonably aware because they're probably people that are uh, you know they live in that area or in or in the Waikato or. Yeah, marine biosecurity in general, uh, the profile has been lifted a lot in the last 10 years. So people are aware um, of the of the risks, you know, through boat shows and just our general comms work that we do uh, through you mostly, Zoe. And so the process that, that happens if we do find a vessel that has got um, a marine pest on it in Tauranga is it's picked up really, really quickly, uh, which is the main, you know, that's the main benefit, getting to it quick letting the boat owner know, and normally they're horrified, um, and the haul-out facility will make room for them to get them out within the day, normally. Um, we found one the other day, and they were juvenile fanworms. They were removed, and normally we uh, work, you know, work really closely with the boat owner because we want to, you know, most of the time they're unaware. So they sort of have done something that they haven't realised that they've got a microscopic fanworm growing on the hull of their boat that they've picked up somewhere. And it gets hauled out, and and um, so the experience for them needs to be uh, that we're not there smacking their hands, that we're working through it with them. Um, if we go down the other way of just telling them off, and and you know um, going down that path where it can be quite confrontational, doesn't work because it will just put people off. So it's about working. Um, you know, we're all in the system together, uh, working for a common cause. So. Uh, that does work quite well i've noticed for 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 all of us really yeah and we'll come back to education and communication shortly alice has had her hand up for a little while alice did you have something further to add um yeah i was just thinking um you know there's been a lot of the other speakers um have talked about some of the other moving parts beyond the regional councils like working with um marina operators haul out yards um, you know, other councils and things, but um, I guess, you know, there is also some work that's done by central government. So NIWA um, does their marine risk surveillance um, surveys. So they go that to about 12 different ports throughout um, Aotearoa. 
and they survey them every six months. So that can also be another way of kind of, you know, they're also in the play for that. And then there's also the um, pre-border work that's mostly done by the Ministry of Primary Industries um, by Security New Zealand. So that's more for the um, commercial vessels or some recreational vessels that are coming to visit um, from overseas. And so they've got different standards and kind of regulatory obligations that those um, visiting vessels need to come and meet before they even come into the border. So that also adds a little bit of more support to the kind of, you know, the different marine biosecurity nets, I suppose, which is how we can kind of try and prevent some of these marine pests from even coming in um, to New Zealand and then to the regions, because that's where our different councils have the responsibility in the regions, but all that work, yeah, before the vessels even come in is by um, Ministry of Primary Industry. So they're also quite involved in that. And then there's also, you know, those international um, regulations, Scott kind of mentioned it a little bit before about um, the ballast water. Um, so that's done by the IMO, which I can never actually remember what the acronym stands for, but it's, yeah, those standards too, which help. Great. Anyone else like to speak on that topic? Um, so your surveillance activities, um, you are looking for marine pests and you're also checking vessels um, around the regions um, using different tools and technology. Um, divers, I, I think you're snorkeling, you've got, um, you've got robot things. Um, can someone please put up their hand to speak to that program? Um, perhaps Dimitri? Or Hamish? Yep, no, I can talk to that. Wow, I'm getting a bit of lens flare going on. There we go, try that. Um, yeah, so it's just interesting uh, hearing how um, it, all the regions um, manage, manage the, um, uh, their pathways and, and do all their surveillance. Um, as you know, Auckland's a, a huge region. Um, you know, it's got a lot of coastline. It's got so many, um, you know, haul out, uh, sorry, anchorages and um, mooring fields, uh, marinas. Um, and, you know, there's only two of us in the team. Um, and I, I feel we're a little bit under-resourced um, given the scope of the work we've got to do. Um, so, you know, we, we don't have the luxury of, of you, know, uh, you know, inspecting all the boats that come into our region. Uh, we really don't have a way of monitoring that. Um, so the best thing we can do is um, we employ divers to do hull surveillance uh, throughout the year. Um, in anchorages, um, mooring fields and marinas. So we're starting to build a pretty good relationship with marina operators um, uh, and explaining all the, the legalities behind that because what we do is we require uh, personal information to be released. Um, and I'll talk to that in a, a little bit later on during this uh, session. Uh, we've got a, a specific thing on the whole surveillance here in, in Auckland. Um, um, yeah, uh, the other thing we do is, um, you know, we've got a Sabella uh, sort of control uh, response that we do on Altea, uh, um, Great Barrier Island. Um, so uh, Hamish and his team, we employ those guys to go over and do the diving for us. Um, and Scott and I were there last, week before last. Um, and uh, as, as Hamish said, um, if you're persistent and doing that removal um, over time, um, we're seeing you know, reductions in, um, in the numbers of Sabella in a lot of those places, um, except for uh, the Wairahi Arm, which is a, a challenging place to, to do any diving, and so control is very hard to do there. Uh, so that one's a little bit out of control still, but um, we're definitely making a, a difference, I think, um, in, in some of the other bays there. Um, I guess incursion response is another thing we do. Uh, if we get uh, a notification from the public or from MPI, because uh, they, they trawl through iNaturalist on a regular basis and they, um, they let us know um, of any new sightings that the public have um, put up. Um, so it's our job to go out there and, and inspect that and just to verify those, those findings if we, can, if we can find it. Uh, anything else, Scott, from you? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. I mean, we're, Dimitri and I have been talking about with the resources we have, trying to do a little more proactive surveillance mm -hmm. and 
some of our areas beyond um, what our contract divers do and what Hamish and those guys do. And um, we're, I think the Calerpa thing in Northland is sort of finally inspired our bosses to a little degree that we've been presenting to them proactive surveillance you know, philosophy since last year. And uh, now this has sort of come to a head. And, and I think, you know, with our thing, the key is with the surveillance is, um, you know, coming from America where we have very limited regulations on marine biosecurity. Um, here, you've got all sorts of good legislation regionally and nationally that you can tap into, but there's still a little bit of institutional inertia <laughs> at the central mm -hmm. government level to sort of understand how important it is to do surveillance and to respond quickly and persistent, as everybody said. So that's one of the things that we're trying to expand a little more in Auckland, since we have such a huge area and huge bunch of marinas, is to try to get outside of, you know, Auckland Harbor and start looking at some more areas proactively. So that's about the only thing I can add to surveillance is the importance of that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, pathways management can only go so far. Um, you've, you've got to keep up that that um, surveillance to go with it. Um, and I think we're trying to, I think we're almost changing our, our managers' minds here to, to sort of allow us to do that. But So what, what, what difference does it, so the surveillance um, presumably enables you to respond quickly if you find something, get in while the incursion is still small, how much of a difference does that make to your success, success rate? Um, to be honest, we haven't found a great deal of things here. Um, and to be honest, we haven't really done a lot of surveillance at all. Not yet. That's what we're aiming to do. Um, <clears throat> we do some diving around the place for training op op purposes. Um, so we, we um, get out, we, we uh, can do snorkeling um, until they uh, work safe changes the, uh, their um, the requirements for work, workplace diving, uh, which we're also working towards. Um, so that, that should be a lot better for us in terms of getting any sort of meaningful surveillance done. The snorkeling is limited. Um, but when we do do it, um, we, you know, there's, there's not a lot that we, we have found yet. Mm. So um, P Peter's got his hand up. Peter, maybe you could address that question. How, how important is early detection to, to a successful outcome when you find an incursion and also then continue into, into what you wanted to address? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'd just like to pick up on what Jono said with the work that Liam did looking at um, uh, how, you know, what we're actually intercepting. And so, you know, uh, surveillance for us has got the intelligence component that people have talked about, which is training the frontline people in marinas, slipways, um, yacht brokerages, some of the public, uh, and so on, which, um, and particularly the divers, um, actually has delivered us really important information at time. So that's, um, that's part of where it comes in. And then um, Jono and our committee have moved us in our inspection component to put more focus on active vessels and particularly finding incoming vessels. And so um, each of those vessels, if they have a pest on them, and fan worms still our most common one, um, represents a, a risk, which is very easily dealt with when you find it, but it's really difficult to deal with once they've dropped stuff all over the seabed. And so our rate of detection uh, out of, um, say, 500 vessels we look at each year using snorkel divers is that we'll find about two or three with fan worm. But those are critical. And you've got to look at those 500 to find the two or three. And if we can find them incoming, as we did for two vessels this last summer, put them you know, into treatment, different treatments for each one. So the response, having found something uh, in the nature of a risk vessel, and if you look at our incident response plan, it distinguishes between risk uh, vessels and, um, and the detection of things at places. You've got to deal with both. And then um, the councils themselves are doing their node inspections with scuba divers across each of those nodes twice a year which actually means that combined with the uh, NIWA survey, the high risk um, port surveillance, it's actually quite hard for anything to be around 
uh, long enough to start reproducing before it gets found. So that's critical as well. Um, and then uh, the, the, the really important thing about incident response has been to reduce the time from something being known to something happening. And so back in the day with didendum on the steel mariner and picton, it took years, literally two years of arguing before somebody took responsibility. Our system sets up a default responsibility across three regional council areas. That means the moment something happens, somebody is responsible. And that's the council where it happened. Um, and so until they can get it off their backs, it's their problem. And that has really changed things. So as a team, we used to provide first um, response uh, um, support for councils. But in fact, we've had enough incidents that all our councils are now really good at doing them, that themselves, and we don't even have to do it anymore. But sustaining that capability and having somebody dedicated um, as Jono does on his staff and builds that experience and connection over time is also critical. So as contractors, we're part-timers, but having full-time people within the council with dedicated responsibility, I think, is a critical part of the system. Alice, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, just to kind of add a little bit on to the importance of surveillance, um, I guess it's also, and I know Hamish kind of touched on it um, before, but it's also a really key part of that kind of behaviour change. Um, we've been doing health surveillance for quite a while in Northland, so each year we try to aim, uh, we aim to survey at least 2,000 hulls over kind of uh, October to May. Um, and we're noticing that over time, the compliance level, so having pretty light biofouling um, on the hull is getting, you know, there's an increase in compliance. So people, you know, are trying to do the right thing and keep their hulls cleaner. So reducing the risk um, that was being spoken about of potentially harboring a marine pest on their vessel hull. Um, and I think that's really important to acknowledge as well, because, you know, by having that persistent, um, we've used that word a lot, persistent kind of presence in or around the water, um, people are starting to understand the importance of what we do and why we do it. And I think that's um, really important to acknowledge. Um, also, just touching on early detection, um, you know, there's been instances that if we didn't have a health surveillance program, we things would have slipped through and we would have, um, you know, good old Mediterranean fan worm definitely in more harbours up here in Northland. I can, or, you know, I can think of at least two examples where because we had somebody looked underneath the bottom of a boat, whether it was myself or um, one of our dive contractors, we actually could get onto it early. We could treat the vessel by encapsulating it, um, getting rid of the fan worm, reducing the risk, and then um, we've been back to those places and there hasn't been those populations in those areas. So um, yeah, the sooner we can get onto things, the higher the chance of you know making sure we don't have an established population of some of those marine pests. Thank you, Jono. Yeah, I guess to, to round out the, potentially round out the surveillance um, aspect, uh, the one thing that we've been crystal clear about from the word go is the why. And I think sometimes um, there can be a bit of a, a temptation just to like, let's go do surveillance, you know, and, you know, look for stuff. But if you don't have a crystal clear understanding around the why and also what may transpire um, should you find something, I think you can get yourself into a little bit of a bind. So each, each region, each area is going to be different, has a different starting point. You know, um, for example, we, we're having conversations, we've had conversations recently with the likes of, you know, Canterbury and Otago, who are more of the early stage of developing what they may be wanting to do. Uh, but for example, Littleton, you know, it's got a, a almost 15 year plus infestation of Mediterranean fanworm. So their why is going to be very different to a region like Marlborough, where we are crystal clear on our why. We're, we're keeping it out. You know, we're in, a, we're in the exclusion camp. Um, we're trying to keep something out. So our surveillance has a, you know, sits underneath that very clear picture about why we're doing what we're doing. So um, yeah. So I guess a critical step in any kind of surveillance is, is having that bigger picture understanding around, you know, what is this? What does this surveillance tie into? Um, and that that could that could vary. The actual activity might be very similar, 
but the why could be very different based on your different starting point around either you might have established pest species, you might be wanting to keep other species out, you might want to solely focus on, on, on vectoring and, and pathway work. And so, you know, it's quite clear if, if that's the case, you're not going to be removing populations and doing population control or, you know, so that that framing your surveillance is, is quite uh, is quite critical in my view. Thank you. Um, so I think I think framing and um, the the reasons why and ensuring that that everyone comes on the journey, especially the major stakeholders and the um, the so-called exacerbators of marine pests is, is really important. And having come from from the boat show a couple of weeks ago in Auckland, the Hutch Walker boat show, I mean, I, I just it, this is purely anecdotal, but I was really pleased to see the people coming to the stand wanting, this is my feeling, wanting um, more information and to see how they could help, which was great. And um, that's testament to the, the investment in education and communications that the councils have made over quite a few years now. And I'm ha Hamish, I'm wondering if you could please talk to, um, to the, the program of education that, that Top of the North has delivered and Alice might be able to add as well from a Northland Council perspective. And one of the Auckland reps um, possibly could also talk uh, about the ambassador program and, and the work that's done on the ground in the marinas and boat ramps in Auckland. Um, but Hamish, could I ask you to start that off? Yeah, no problems. <laughs> um, but obviously, education is is a, a major tool that we need um, to work properly within the marine uh, biosecurity system. Uh, we've been, yeah, we have been doing it for for quite some time now, probably uh, 10, 10 or twelve, maybe longer. With Northland Regional Council's probably been doing it the longest. Um, and what it looks like is uh, really the the coal face, really talking to to boat owners, um, uh, just about marine pests, why they're, why they're a problem. I mean, a lot of people don't, one, don't know them, and then two, don't realise how bad they are or potentially could be if they're not in the country. Uh, boat shows have been super important. I mean, um, we have been going to boat shows for, I may be incorrect here, Zoe, but it feels like about eight years, um, quite, quite some time. Right? Yeah. And we're talking to thousands of people. It's actually a really, really cool, um, cool project to be involved in because it's multi-regional. Uh, it's not just one regional council standing there and talking about an, an issue. It's it's all of us, which is you know super important within this space because we have got really good relationships as regional councils. We can work together, um, and we need to as well. We can't do it on our own. We have to work together um, to to get to get. The messages across and to be on the same page really and I think it's quite good for the public to see that it's not just one regional council saying something it's a it's a group it's a partnership we're working together um so the boat shows I mean we talk to a lot of people you get a lot of people that um, ask some really good questions that um might take a little a little bit of convincing but um most often we get there and then um we also have uh, collateral as well, which we use to um, reward people um, after they've had to endure talking to one of us for 20 minutes. And um, that's quite cool too. It's dedicated to uh, the boaty. Uh, it might be um, chamois cloths or uh, uh, towels, hooded towels or whatever it is. And that's pretty cool too, because it's a good starter. Everybody likes getting something for free. And um, if they get something for free and they get to learn a whole whole heap of really important information off of people like us, then then that's um that's really good. Um, the ambassador stuff, I'll probably pass on to Alice. She's um probably more aptly uh, qualified to talk about that. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So. We, I guess what's been really great about um, some of the work we've done with the, I, can, I guess I can only speak for the top of the north, sorry, but um, we've really kind of combined resources and experiences together. And so um, Northland, Auckland and Bay of Plenty with support from some other organisations have come up with this really cool education resource, which is pitched to um, young people. So from years 
five to year eight. So what is that? Eight years old to about 12 years old. And it's a resource that's focused purely about marine biosecurity. So there's a lot of fantastic marine education resources out there, but there was this real hole, um, I guess, for the niche area of marine biosecurity. And, you know, obviously we, a lot of people here know lots about it and are very passionate about it. But for some people looking at some of the things like you can see in the jars and on the table, um, you know, they have no idea what a Mediterranean sandworm is. They honestly think they're looking at a tank of sticks. So I think it's just to really, people don't really, if they don't know, they won't understand or they won't care. So I think that kind of outreach and the education side of things as to what these things are, why they can be a problem. And then that really key element, which you touched on Zoe, is also like what they can do to help um, and providing that as kind of Jono said, the, the why, the context, makes it a lot more, and I think people understand a lot clearer why there are rules in place and why there are best practice guidelines and things like that, um, when they can see these things and understand and get an idea of these things could actually be a real problem. But if we kind of combine resources and, um, you know, there might be a chance of detecting things early, which we have seen recently, you know, through iNaturalist um, with the first occurrence of um, Calerpa being found in New Zealand on Aotea, Great Barrier Island. Um, that mm. was you know, originally iNaturalist, which I think is really cool um, kind of way to empower people um, in their contributions. So, yeah, we have some partnerships with different community groups. So um, we have a big one with Experiencing Marine Reserves up here in Northland. Um, but we also do other, you know, we go into schools and um, lead dissections with the students and talk to give quite a practical experience to marine biosecurity. Um, and we're, you know, working on some partnerships with Hapu um, around Northland as well, because that's also a really key you know, very important relationship, but also lots of um, different ways of sharing knowledge of how things used to be and then how we might be able to tackle some of these future problems using a combination of Western science and tools, but also maturanga Māori um, and, you know, knowledge and tools and that um, element as well. But I'll pass it over to Auckland Council to talk about their ambassador program, which is really cool. Thanks, Alice. Um, yes, so we've had an ambassadors program uh, going for a little while now, um, uh, on and off, uh, depending on the budget, um, but uh, we employ uh, a bunch of people um, who um, we retrain up in, in our messaging. Um, we have a, a special trailer that's being built. Um, so one half of that is to do with marine, bio uh, marine biosecurity and the other half is uh, sort of island um, pathways management management with that's to do with um, ants, stoats, um, uh, you know, uh, rats, uh, things like that, um, and educating uh, people on, on, on that side of things. So we do, here we do above and below the water. Um, so we don't want people um, transporting things under their boat or on top of their boat um, uh, between the islands here uh, and even interregionally. <clears throat> Um, so they'll, we'll set them up every, I think it's over the summer period mostly, um, we'll, we'll have them out uh, for a few months and they'll visit various locations like boat ramps, uh, marinas um, and other popular places um, uh, where, you know, people just come up and talk. They've got a whole bunch of um, pamphlets and, uh, yeah, they'll just talk about uh, pathways management really um, and educate the punters um, on uh, best practice. Thank you. Peter, is there anything, or, or Jono, anything you'd like to add from the South Island perspective uh, regarding education and communication? You go first, Jono. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess talking about joining forces, um, that was the whole background behind the top of the South Marine Biosecurity Partnership, because that did start, you know, with what uh, you know, which we still are, three small unitary councils. Why would we go and try and do this on our own? So that's why we joined forces. And a lot of it was around um, education and awareness building in our, in our broader top of the South region. Um, so we did actually, we haven't been, we primarily deliver most of that through that partnership, through the work of Peter, which he can touch on in a moment. Um, while uh, I wouldn't say we, 
been able to park it ourselves as a council, but it meant that we can focus on our operational aspects and our direct relationships in terms of a lot of those operational programs, and then know that we have a good resource base um, behind the scenes um, with our, our Top of the South Partnership um, contractors. So I'll let Peter explain what they do in that space. Great, thanks, John. So yeah, and we in this context, we also work um, in the Greater Wellington area because um, one of our, you know, looking at those pathways, 80% of the visiting recreational vessels going into Jono's region and Marlborough come from Wellington. So whatever happens in Wellington is going to happen in the outer sounds. Um, and so we can't just restrict ourselves to one place. Um, and we've tried lots of different avenues, um, uh, regular newsletters, uh, talking to a lot of people. So when we're doing our on the water surveillance, we're talking to a lot of boaties, we're going to marinas, and we're trying to reach key people in the system. Uh, so with marine farming being quite big here, whoever's moving spat and gear around becomes particularly important. And so reaching out into those companies um, uh, directly and through Aquaculture New Zealand and the Marine Farming Association is also pretty vital to us. Um, the disappointing thing um, is that since 2009, while providing a lot of education to Bodies, we've been measuring the amount of fouling on hulls and keeping that data over that whole time. And we haven't really moved that index in the way that Northland's saying they have. And I think something there's some th two things that we've been told that Northland did that made a real difference. One was you started charging the boaties for it. And um, some boaties have said to me that was the greatest public awareness thing you could have done, made them wake up and, and want to know what, how come they were having put their hand in their pockets. They don't like that very much. But um, while you might have got some negative reaction, you certainly got awareness and you've also um, taken to using various forms of enforcement um, and actually changing the cost for people of non-compliance. Um, so education alone is not sufficient. It's really, really important. But I think the biggest gain we had out of the education um, was that we did change the profile of vessels coming from Wellington. So that was really important. And that was working through marinas and clubs. Uh, and um, we worked out that some of the reasons that we weren't getting changes in places like Nelson was due to the infrastructure. And that allowed the um, agencies to begin working on rectifying that and it is getting changed. So sometimes the changes from education is not just at the direct end of the people who are uh, on the vectors, uh, it's also at the end of the people that can make changes that allow those folks to do what they need to do. So you can educate people as much as you like, but if there's no um, cost-effective way of cleaning your vessel, when you need to do it, um, then you've still got the same problem. Yes. Th th thank you, Peter. Um, I think anyone who, who would like to take a look at the, the communications and, and work that both of the partnerships do, um, the top of the North website is marinepest.nz and the South Island equivalent is marinebiosecurity.co.nz. Um, and there's social media channels, newsletters, um, and it's a really good way to, to, keep, to keep up. And definitely I agree with Peter that it's about um, the carrot and the stick and also using communications to influence the, and, and inform the stakeholders, decision makers, um, and to kind of pull together the, the wider picture sometimes. Um, there's, there's certainly some connections that you, can, that you can make when you're thinking about communications or sitting in on a meeting that, that you otherwise might not make. Um, so we'll, we'll, we're getting close to 11 o'clock and I don't want to hold anyone up before their next meeting. So we'll move on to the Clean Hill Plan. Um, hey, Mitch, I'm hoping you can give an overview um, of the, the work that's been done <clears throat> in the Upper North Island and with MPI and DOC towards this programme. Yeah, maybe you have to be a quick overview, Zoe. Um, so yeah, the Clean Hull Plan, really really in a nutshell, um, what we've currently got throughout the marine biosecurity system in New Zealand is regional pest management plans that have rules within them. And they're, uh, they're inconsistent with each other. Well, not they're not inconsistent with each other, but they're just different. So we've got different rules for different regions. And, and in the marine biosecurity space, that's a bit of a problem because you know, people are obviously traveling through each of those regions to get to the location they want to go through. 
And what we see at the boat, well, what we hear at the boat show is that um, people are just a little bit confused by having multiple um, multiple rules or different rules for different regions. Um, so the clean hull plan in a nutshell is, a, is one set of rules uh, throughout the whole of New Zealand eventually as a national plan. Um, currently it's been trolled as a, as a pilot for the, just for the top of the North region, which houses 70% of the vessel fleet. Um, and it's around um, a consistent role for biofouling and the movement uh, pathways plan. Pathways plans were allowed, bought in uh, through changes to the Biosecurity Act, so it allowed for the development of national or inter-regional path, pathways plans. And the pathway, a pathway plan is more about uh, the vector as opposed to uh, the pest. So really it's just about having consistent rules um, throughout the whole of New Zealand, um, and that will be a benefit uh, to boaties because it's going to make it clearer for them. You know, they know what they need to do wherever they go. It's going to be the same. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much nine years worth of work in about a minute, Zoe. But um, and you've I got one more a... minute to talk about the marine vessel. All <laughs> cool that's come out of this, out of this, um, this program. One, one minute for the MVP. Okay. Well, you could probably have two minutes. I think. <laughs> Yeah, so we've developed a, a database called this, the Marine Vessel Portal, and um, it's, we've been developing it for the last couple of years now. And what it does, it enables to start with regional councils um, to enter in inspection information relating to not only to vessels, but also to marina uh, operational areas, benthic areas, ports, um, other sites where um, they may need to check. And it houses all of that information. Primarily it's for vessel information. Um, so currently I think we've got around about 13 and a half thousand vessels um, loaded in there and they're unique records. So it's sort of like a registration um, and it has a unique re record for the vessel, photo, name, length, um, a whole heap of information, no private information. Um, and that's housed in there, and anybody that's using the uh, marine vessel portal can view it. So, uh, as an example, all of our boats in the Bay of Plenty are in there, and if one of our boats goes to Auckland, then uh, or to Northland or Waikato, um, staff there can open it up uh, and look at it. It's a Esri product, so it's called Hub, which is the website version, um, Esri's website version that can be viewable anywhere, it's just the website. And then there's the in in, um, in the field version, which is uh, field maps and survey one, two, three. So it's, it's a big benefit for regional councils because you can get an idea of a risky vessel or whatever it is, uh, and you can view it and you can do an inspection on it. Uh, it's good for reporting too. You get really, some really good dashboards. You can uh, run queries on how many vessels you've got. You can actually see, like Peter was talking about, uh, levels of foul, how they've changed over a long period of time. The data set we've got in there is is three years now. So, uh, but eventually we'll get quite a good data set. So you can look in different locations and see, you know, has the level of foul got better in there? And it might be an intervention by a marina operator that's decided, you know, that they want all of their vessels in their marina to be clean. Uh, or just generally our education program. And yeah, so the last boat show, last couple of boat shows we did, we're rolling it out to boat owners so they can go in and claim their vessel. Um, and then, so what that, the benefit for them is that currently uh, if there's a rule somewhere that says that you need to prove that your boat's clean, I mean, they've, they've got access to that information. Uh, we will have uh, uh, rolling out uh, later this year Call out facilities that can enter anti foul records against um, vessel records. So, if someone goes in and claims their boat, say, yeah, that's mine, goes through the two factor authentication, whatever it's called, that some IT people like doing, um, and they've said, yep, that's my boat, they can show that to a marina operator, um, send that information via a PDF report that they can get out of it show it to the marina operator and they're free to go to the location um, if they've done what they need to do. So yeah, it's still sort of in development, but we're, we're sort of 90, 95% of the way there, um, but it's gonna be a super valuable tool 
it will be the tool that we will be using when we roll out a pathways plan, whether it's uh, interregional with a top of the north or a national plan. That was probably more than two minutes. Sorry, Zoe. You're all good. Look, it's exactly 11 o'clock. Um, so really happy to take questions now, but also to um, finish the meeting and then anyone that would like to stay on and chat informally is, is very welcome to. Um, so thank you everyone for, um, for coming. Um, really, really appreciate your time. Um, and also to our panelists in particular for sharing their knowledge. Um, thank you. Thank you, Zoe. <laughs> Thanks for running the session. <laughs> really happy.